Hi, this is Manos Burlakis and this is video 22.1 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This video discusses coronary angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention in patients who have spontaneous coronary artery dissection. This is the pathologic basis of the disease, which is characterized by creation of a communication between the true lumen and the subintimal space. This can lead to hematoma formation in the subintimal space and compression of the true lumen, leading to either stenosis or obstruction of the coronary artery and resulting ischemia. These are the 14 steps of percutaneous coronary intervention. We will go over each one of them, discussing how they specifically apply in patients with spontaneous coronary dissection. Starting with planning. Planning is not always possible because the diagnosis of SCAD is often made at the time of diagnostic angiography. However, SCAD should be suspected in young women presenting with acute coronary syndromes, especially in the peripartum setting, with the highest incidence being in the first week after delivery. Monitoring is critical when performing PCI or angiography in patients with SCAD because they do have high risk of deterioration and hemodynamic collapse. In terms of medications, if PCI is performed, then the coagulation is administered as per standard practice in almost all cases with unfractionated heparin, and then dual antipetlet therapy is administered as well. If uh, there is a suboptimal result of the PCI with residual dissection flaps, then administration of more potent P2Y12 inhibitors such as prasugrel or ticagrelor can be considered. However, glycoprotein 2 b 3 inhibitors or cagrelor should not be used in those patients. In terms of uh, arterial access, if the diagnosis of SCAD is suspected, then femoral access is preferred because some studies have shown higher iatrogenic dissection risk when radial access is obtained, possibly because of more difficulty engaging the coronary arteries. Engagement should be as much coaxial as possible, and deep intubation should be avoided to minimize the risk of causing an additional dissection. Coronary angiography is critical for the diagnosis of spontaneous coronary artery dissection. The classic appearance of multiple radiolucent lumens, which is SCAD type 1, is actually present in the minority of cases, about 25%. The most common presentation is that of a long, diffuse, a smooth narrowing. This is the type 2 SCAD that uh, can be subdivided in type 2A, that has some normal segments, and 2B, which is diffuse narrowing, that goes all the way to the distal segment of the coronary artery. And finally, there is the type 3 SCAD that mimics atherosclerosis and presents as a focal or tubular stenosis, and for those intravascular imaging, is often important to establish the diagnosis. Injections should be gentle, once again to minimize the risk of causing an additional dissection, and the majority of SCAD is actually present in the left anterior descending artery. Also, the mid and the distal segments of the coronaries are more commonly involved. These are some examples of type 1 SCAD with a radiolucent segment in the mid LAD, type 2A in which there is diffuse narrowing of the distal right coronary artery with normal appearing vessels more proximal and more distally, Type 2B, where there's diffuse stenosis all the way to the end of the vessel. And type 3, it appears as a more focal tubular stenosis. There has been also a proposal for having a type 4 SCAD, in which there is occlusion of the vessel distally, that subsequently spontaneously recanalizes, and in patients in whom embolism has been excluded. This is an example of a patient who comes with an acute coronary syndrome and has a type 2B spontaneous coronary dissection with diffuse involvement of the mid and distal LAD. 
Step number seven, which is determining the target lesion. This can be a very difficult step. We do know that performing percutaneous coronary intervention in patients with SCAD has significant risk of having a complication, such as extending the dissection or having migration of the hematoma. So in patients who present with SCAD, if they are stable without any ongoing symptoms and they don't have any high-risk anatomy, then conservative therapy is preferred. If they are stable, but they have left main dissection or severe proximal two-vessel dissection, then cabbage should be considered. The problem is when they have active ongoing ischemia or hemodynamic instability, sometimes they may have um, sustained ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. In those patients, revascularization is usually needed and that can be done either with urgent cabbage, if possible, or with percutaneous coronary intervention. If PCI is selected as the next step, then step number eight, wiring, is what comes next. That can be challenging because uh, wiring may not be able to get through that area of dissection. It is preferred to use soft workhorse guide wires because the polymer jacketed wires might actually enter into the subintimal space and extend the dissection. But in any case, it is important to confirm that a distal true lumen wire position has been achieved before performing balloon angioplasty and stent placement. If this is not possible, then balloon angioplasty and standing should not be performed. When it comes to lesion preparation, if possible to cover the entire area of spontaneous dissection, then direct standing is often the preferred strategy. However, there is also a strategy of potentially using a cutting balloon for decompressing the hematoma. Cutting balloons should not be used in left main dissections, but it's usually used in patients who have um, TM0 or less than 2 flow and ongoing symptoms. The balloon size should be small, at least uh, half a millimeter smaller than the size of the artery, and should not be used in very small vessels which are less than 2 millimeters in diameter. The balloon should be inflated at low pressure, and typically short balloons are used. And then if an optimal result is achieved, this is great, but if not, then standing should be performed if possible. When it comes to stenting, it is best to use a single stent if possible, always making sure that both edges of the dissection are covered for at least 5 millimeters. The stent diameter should be small, Oversized stents should be avoided, as again they can extend the dissection. When stenting is performed, one should always keep in mind that uh, stenting may actually extend the dissection or lead to hematoma migration and worsening of the patient's clinical status, and also that long stent lengths are often required with the resultant high risk of restenosis, and also after absorption of the subintimal hematoma, there is the possibility of late stent strut malaposition. This is why putting stents is a concern in patients with SCAD. This was the same patient we saw before with a mid-LAD SCAD in whom there is a stent placed in the LAD, but there was subsequent extension of the dissection into the LAD, the circumflex, and the left main, leading to essentially cessation of flow and cardiac arrest. This is another patient who has a SCAD in the distal right coronary artery, there was balloon angioplasty, improving the flow, followed by stand placement. However, although now the area of SCAD is covered, there is a new dissection in the proximal portion of the artery, which required implantation of another stand, which led to a nice final result. The result here is suboptimal. There still may be some residual lesion, and actually this patient did develop restenosis in this area. This is another example of a patient with SCAD who underwent stenting, <clears throat> which has led to migration of the hematoma more proximally and then occlusion of the left main. So whenever a stent is placed in SCAD patients, there should always be vigilance 
because of complications that are possible. This is a SCAD PCI algorithm by Jacques Esso. In patients who have high risk features, then management with revascularization is indicated. If not, then conservative treatment is the way to go. If the SCAD involves the left main, then bypass is preferred unless the patient uh, cannot go for emergency bypass or the patient is unstable with cardiogenic shock, VT or VF. Ideally, there should be no involvement of the left main bifurcation. If the SCAD involves non-left main vessel, then the first step is to wire into the distal trilumen. This can be challenging and if it fails, then the procedure should be stopped. If it is unclear whether the wire is in the distal trilumen, then intravascular imaging can be performed. Sometimes one can get a microcatheter or over the wire balloon and inject, but this carries the risk of extending the dissection. If wiring is successful, and then if for type 1, 3, and 2A SCAD, one can cover the entire area of dissection with at least 5 mm past the proximal and the distal edge, then direct stenting is performed. However, if this is not possible, or for type 2B spontaneous coronary dissection, then one could use cutting balloon, as we discussed before, or do balloon angioplasty first, followed by stenting. For type 2A, one could stand the edges first and then the middle, or one could stand the proximal part of the vessel and not the distal, especially for type 2B dissections, which may extend all the way to the edge, to the distal part of the vessel. Arterial closure is done as per standard practice. Coronary physiology essentially does not have uh, any role in patients with SCAD, whereas intravascular imaging can be extremely useful as it can confirm the diagnosis or confirm distal true lumen wiring. However, advancing the equipment past area of dissection might lead to extension of the dissection. These are examples of optical coherence tomography. This is an area of uh, communication between the true lumen and the subintimal space. The same here with some hematoma formation and also here with some subintimal hematoma formation as well. Intravascular ultrasound is less sensitive for diagnosing spontaneous coronary dissection, but this is an example of a patient with SCAD who has developed subintimal hematoma. Finally, hemodynamic support should be available when performing coronary angiography and PCI in SCAD patients because they may have extension of the dissection leading to proximal vessel occlusion and hemodynamic deterioration. This is the patient we described before who ended up having occlusion of the left main. The patient had cardiac arrest requiring cardiac resuscitation. Eventually, she was placed on VA ECMO. Fortunately, the cath team was able to stand into the LAD in the circumflex and restore the flow. And then the patient eventually survived, but once again, had VA ECMO not been available, the patient would likely not have survived uh, that procedure. So in summary, SCAD is an uncommon cause of acute coronary syndromes, but it is most common in women, especially in the peripartum period. The LAD is the vessel that is more commonly affected, and most commonly, SCAD presents with an angiographic type 2 presentation, that is, with a long diffuse narrowing. If the patient is stable, has no ongoing symptoms, and does not have left main involvement of, or two-vessel proximal involvement, then conservative treatment is preferred because PCI does carry significant risk. However, if the patient does have left main or proximal to vessel dissection, coronary bypass is preferred. If the patient has active ongoing ischemia and urgent bypass is not an option, then PCI can be performed. True lumen wire should be confirmed before doing anything else. And then if it is possible to cover the entire area of dissection with a single stand, that is preferred. Cutting balloon is another option with standing reserved in case a suboptimal result is achieved. And finally, patients with SCAD do have a significant risk for recurrence, about 10%, and that is why they should continue to be monitored 
after percutaneous coronary intervention is performed. Thank you.